let's uh, let's get started. So for our second talk today, we're very lucky to have Sergio Kleinerman from Princeton University. He'll be telling us about uh, stability of curve for, for small angular momentum. Sergio. Okay, well, thank you very much, first of all, for the invitation. Uh, it's a pleasure, I would have preferred to be in person, but uh, uh, so it is. Uh, I'll be talking about uh, results uh, obtained in collaboration with uh, Jeremy Septel and also Elena Georgi. Uh, it concerns the Einstein uh, vacuum equation, so Ricci equal to zero. And of course, I, I did, in this audience, everybody of course knows that uh, we have initial data sets to satisfy constraint equations. We have the maximal uh, future global hyperbolic development that you construct from the initial data. And we have a, a large family of solutions, uh, which are which is a care, the famous care family. Uh, and uh, also, I should say, I'm not going to talk about the case where uh, cosmological constant is positive, but of course, there are very interesting results, uh, which will be presented presumably by Higgs on Thursday. Uh, so uh, here is a major problem in general relativity, stability of care. The conjecture says that if you, if you start up with a care solution, which is represented here in this picture, uh, this is the horizon. Uh, and uh, you look at the domain of other communications, you take uh, some initial condition, I mean, you take some slice, and you perturb the initial conditions of care a little bit, and the conjecture is that the maximum future global hyperbolic development is going to lead to another care solution uh, with different, uh, different A's and different N, right? So the final A, final uh, so the st status of the theorem is uh, such, uh, first, so the, we think the result is true for absolute value of A over X, much less than one. So this is a case of small angular momentum. So there are uh, results which have already been published. I mean, not published, but uh, they are on archive and submitted for publication. So this is a result uh, uh, with Jeremy Sattel in 2021 which is uh, part one, I will explain what is the difference between part one and part two. And part two refers to work that I do in collaboration with, uh, also with Elena. Elena uh, in addition, there are two other papers, uh, uh, which are uh, GCM papers. GCM stands for uh, General Covariant Modulated Spheres. And uh, I'll talk more about this uh, later on. So let's, uh, let's look at the, in general what stability means. So if you have a nonlinear problem, n of i is equal to zero, you, you, you want to solve, uh, assuming that you have already a solution, which typically it's a stationary solution, and uh, you want to perturb off it. So you add uh, phi zero plus psi and you try to solve. And then there are various no notions of stability. There is orbital stability which is the weakest, which means that psi simply stays bounded for all time. Asymptotic stability, which tells you that psi actually comes to zero, and orbital asymptotic stability, uh, which tells you that, uh, that uh, phi zero plus psi will converge not to the original phi zero, but to a final, to a different one, which is also a stationary solution. So this is a situation of the conjecture that uh, I just uh, said. Uh, and then uh, obviously, the first thing that you do in situations like this, you go to the linearized equations. So this is uh, n prime of uh, phi zero psi is equal to zero. So this is a usual the standard Fisher derivative. And um, uh, what people usually do, if you are a physicist, to do mode stability. In other words, you, this equation has symmetry. Uh, you decompose by uh, in modes and you study the behavior of modes. So uh, this is typically what physicists do and more or less they end there. Uh, boundedness would mean of course that psi stays bounded and quantitative decay, which is the really important one, is to show that, uh, that psi also goes to zero. And of course to do the nonlinear problem, you, you need uh, this quantitative decay. Uh, then, uh, if you go to the Einstein vacuum equations, what's very specific about it is that you have uh, this two parameter family uh, of care solution, which implies that you are going to have a lot of zero modes, 
uh, two zero modes actually corresponding to this, but there is also the general covariance, uh, which means that the solution is defined only up to uh, classes of equivalence. Uh, so therefore, uh, you have a lot of uh, other zero modes that come from this uh, general covariance, and uh, and uh, that's one of the reasons that makes the problem hard, even in linear theory. So, uh, so what we know about linear stability, uh, formal modes analysis, uh, and I'm going to go again very fast because this was already was already discussed in uh, Peter's talk yesterday. Uh, so we have something at the level of metric perturbations, in other words, the study of metric perturbation by Reggie Wheeler, Michel Schwarzerili, uh, Newman Penrose, which is done at the level of the curvature. Uh, and uh, this is uh, work by but in Presto, Kolsky, Presto, Kolsky. And uh, uh, there is a difference between these equations, the equations that, that, that are obtained in uh, metric perturbation theory. So there is an invariant equation that you have to be careful, of course, with, with the fact that uh, there is this huge gauge uh, group that uh, I mentioned here, which you have to somehow mod out to get an invariant equation, which is uh, this Reggie Wheeler equation. Uh, and then in, in this Newman Penrose uh, formalism, you get a Tokolsky type equation uh, where uh, you have additional linear terms, which make the problem, is, as uh, Peter said yesterday, uh, makes a problem uh, difficult to study directly because uh, it doesn't have a conservation of energy, for example. It's not conservative. So you have to do something else. And uh, uh, anyway, the, there is a food, mo food mode stability done by Whiting. But uh, more important for us is this observation, this remarkable observation made by Chandra Sekar that you can pass from uh, this equation, which is not conservative, you can pass to this equation, which is conservative. So this is the famous chandra Sekar transformation. Uh, and then, uh, so, okay, so this is at the level of mode stability, which as I said, is very far, very far. It's even far from getting uh, boundedness and not to speak about decay. Uh, so uh, you have to get to the modern era uh, of uh, robust linear stability, uh, which, uh, I just go again very fast. There is this, the scalar wave equation in Nikovsky space. So this is work by Moravitz, uh, Fritz John, myself. A uh, uh, few equations, again, in linear theory, which is uh, Christo Dugan and myself. And this, of course, played an important role in the stability of non-linear stability of Nikovsky space. Uh, in the case uh, of Schwarzschild, when A is equal to zero, there is uh, the first important works were done by Sofer, Blue Sofer. Blue Stervens, and then later by the famous Radiansky, Matsuola, Metcalf, Tataro, Tokanana, which really uh, clarified uh, a lot of the issues. Um, the, the case uh, of K, where A is stable as an L, there, there was the famous Radiansky who, who proved, but the first to prove uh, boundaries, and then was Tataro, Tokanana, uh, that proved decay, that got the first uh, decay results. And then there was uh, the work of Anderson Blue, which uh, plays an important role in what I'm going to talk about later on, so I'll leave it for later. Uh, then uh, for the full range, uh, A less than M, there is uh, uh, the famous work of the Fermos, uh, Jansky, and Schrappert, Rothman. Uh, then when you go to the actual linear stability of the Einstein equations, or the Einstein-Lacan equations, the first important result was proved by the Fermos, Rothman, and Rothmansky. And then, uh, uh, so it, and an important part here was to uh, do a chandra Steka transformation in physical space. So they found a, a way to do everything in physical space uh, and then analyze the, the Tokolsky equation using the chandra Steka transformation. In other words, using the Reggie Wheeler equations, which is obtained by the transformation. Uh, then uh, this was uh, extended to care for a strict less than M. For small a's uh, by Ma and then by the thermos von Segan uh, Then uh, uh, linear stability for the full system in care for small a was done by uh, Anderson, Dactyl, Blue, and Ma, and separately by Hintz and Bassi with very different methods. I guess Hintz and Bassi go more in, in the direction of, uh, of metric perturbations, while this one is still based on uh, NPR, the, uh, on the, sorry, not, Newman Penrose type uh, formalism. Uh, 
Uh, finally, there, there are some results now also for uh, the full range by uh, Schlappen and Rothman and uh, Slater and Costa. All right, so uh, let's talk about the nonlinear case. So here, here are the results in the case of nonlinear stability. There are, obviously, there are fewer results than in the linear case. There is, of course, stability of Mikoski. Uh, there is a stability of Schwarzschild. Uh, there was uh, uh, my work with uh, Jeremy Sartain in 2018, and as we heard yesterday, uh, there is also now the work of Dafra Moschotz and Gerd Rodjanski, uh, Martin in uh, Taylor uh, in 2021. And then uh, when it comes to stability of care for small a, which I mentioned before, uh, there are uh, uh, various results, for example, uh, my results is uh, Jeremy, uh, or, which are the GCM spheres in perturbation of care, effective results on informalization and GCM spheres in perturbation of care. So these are two different ones. Uh, there is uh, the work uh, uh, with uh, Elena Giorgi also on general formalities for care stability. I'll talk a little bit about this. Then there is a work uh, of last year on stability of care, so part one, uh, which is uh, as Peter said yesterday, uh, is based on sort of assuming that you already have good estimates for the curvature. I mean, in particular, good estimates for, uh, for A, uh, alpha, alpha bar. These are the extreme components of the curvature. Uh, and then uh, you derive everything else. So this was uh, last year. And uh, now uh, what I want to talk about is the second part, which hopefully will appear soon, which is uh, again work with uh, Elena. There is also another work by Shen, uh, which is on GCM hypersurfaces and perturbation of care. I will probably, if I have a chance, I'll say a few words about it. All right, the important thing is to talk about the geometric fra framework because everything is based on this. So, uh, so let me uh, start by saying that uh, in all these work, usually you start with an R pair. So you have a space time, and on the space time, you have, you have uh, at every point, you have uh, a null pair, which means two null vectors, which verifies this uh, normalization condition. Uh, and there is a horizontal structure associated with it. In other words, you take the space perpendicular to this three, four, and uh, we call it H. And you can also take, of course, you can take a, a basis of H, uh, which we'll call E1, E2 uh, later on. So, uh, and then you define connection coefficients. So for example, you define kappa A, B, Right, so A and B stands for one and two. Uh, it's G of uh, derivative uh, phi four in the direction of the A. This you put uh, instead of phi four, you put this three, you get kappa bar. And then uh, in general, and this is uh, sort of important for the talk here, is that uh, uh, unless uh, the horizontal structure is integral, which generally is not, uh, when you decompose chi, you decompose into uh, a symmetric transverse tensor, which I call kappa half. Uh, and then uh, there is an expansion, one half trans chi delta AB. But there is also an anti symmetric part, which I call uh, this uh, A trace chi. Right? And this is uh, the usual anti symmetric tensor of uh, run two, two dimensions. And the same thing for kappa bar. Now, this, uh, this new quantities. Uh, which do not appear in stability of Nikoski space. By the way, the notations uh, that I use are the ones in stability of Nikoski space with, with Christo Bulu. Uh, so in addition of trace, trace chi, trace chi bar, there are these two new quantities, which are a trace chi and a trace chi bar, and they are exactly zero when you have integrability. And again, in, in Christo Bulu Kleinerman, we have integrability. Uh, it defines also curvature coefficients exactly in the same way, alpha, are uh, EA4, EB4, and alpha bar. Uh, it's important to complexify if you are in this. I mean, you see, when we talk about care, it's very important to complexify. So you put, for example, rho and rho star. So usually, in stability of Mikoski space, this was called sigma. I prefer to call it rho star. So you, go, you, you, have, you have P is rho plus I rho star, and you define also X, capital X, is chi plus I chi star. So this is dual relative to the, the Hodge dual relative to the horizontal structure, which is well defined, X bar, uh, A, A bar, and so on and so forth. So we are, we are going to get this way uh, a set of connection coefficients. 
x, x bar, psi, psi bar, h, capital H, capital H bar. This was essentially the eta and eta bar before, which are now complexified. You have uh, z, omega, and omega bar, and you have the curvature, a, b, p, b, underline b, and underline b. So uh, and then, of course, uh, you get equations. These are the, the standard Catan dynamic equations uh, of the type d gamma plus gamma times gamma is r and dr. So this is the Bianchi. These are the Bianchi equations. Uh, so let me make a, a, a very fast comparison to the uh, formalism uh, NP and GHP. Uh, they they are both based. So the NP is the first one to be used, but they are based. Uh, they are all, all based on scalarization. So all the quantities that are used uh, are scalar quantities. Uh, while in uh, this approach here, everything is tensorial. As you see, everything is tensorial relative to the horizontal uh, structure. So you, you can think of this as sort of a bundle, uh, the horizontal structure being the, the bundle part of the space time. Uh, and uh, if you compare with this uh, little line, it's exactly the same thing, with the exception of this uh, lack of integrability. So in that in in Christopher Kleinerman, there was uh, this condition was satisfied, and we had integrability. And of course, everything was based, in fact, on, on what we call S horizontal structures. Anyway, uh, another important thing to to take into account are null null Frank transformations. So you start up with a you start up with a pair is three four and a pair and you want to go maybe to a different pair. There's no particular reason to choose one. I mean uh, we have to be uh, we have to be equalitarian and look at all possible frames. And uh, these transformations are extremely important. And uh, uh, it's also important to see how each component. Of Ricci and curvature coefficients, how they transform when you do this transformation. By the way, these transformations are highly nonlinear. You can also write them down in linear theory, but, uh, but uh, they are highly nonlinear themselves. Okay, so then uh, you go to the Kerr family, uh, which everybody here knows. Uh, the important thing here is maybe that I, I introduce this function uh, r plus i a cosine theta, which shows up all the time uh, in uh, what we do. And uh, uh, well, these are stationary axisymmetric, of course, the Kerr family. Uh, this is a Pendo's picture of it, and so on and so forth. Uh, now, uh, the more important thing to, to be said here is that the Kerr family comes together with principal null direction. So, again, this was mentioned by Peter and his talk. Uh, they, they are specifically described in terms of the Boer Linkless coordinates, which we had at the beginning. You also have a canonical basis for the horizontal structure. Uh, by the way, we don't need, I mean, that what's very, very important in what we do is that we don't need to take a canonical basis. We don't need to talk about specific vectors. Uh, it's really the horizontal structures that matters. Uh, and that, of course, that's the difference with uh, Newman Pendos or uh, uh, where they have to make choices of, uh, of these vectors. Okay, anyway, the crucial fact that uh, I should mention is that in care relative to a principal null pair, so in as well relative to this uh, pair here, uh, you get that the curvature components A and bar, so th these are the extreme curvature components, and, uh, but also B and B bar, which are the other the curvature component, they're all zero, and P, which you remember is this rho plus i rho star, is exactly minus 2m over q to the power 3. So q, again, is this r plus i cos i theta. In addition, you get the chi hat, chi bar hat, psi and psi bar are equal to zero. Okay, so again, you can really express that in, in terms of the complex quantities. This would be uh, x hat, x bar hat, capital psi, and capital psi bar equal to zero. Uh, in Schwarzschild, in addition, you get that uh, the horizontal structure is integrable. So this a trace chi and trace chi bar are actually zero. And also, uh, you get the fact that the imaginary parts uh, of X, which is uh, which is uh, it's, uh, chi plus uh, i chi star, are uh, equal to zero. So in other words, only chi and chi bar come up, which is the equation of stability of Minkowski space. You don't see anything else. Uh, you also have rho star is equal to zero, which is the imaginary part of p, right? So uh, finally, if you are in Minkowski, all curvature components are zero, including this one. So in Minkowski space, of course, everything is zero. With the exception of Tresky, Tresky. 
All right, then uh, uh, a little bit, a few words about uh, all effects of perturbation. So if, if you want to talk about perturbation, the simplest way to talk about them is to, uh, is to consider uh, a space time together with a structure is three, four, and the horizontal structure. But I also need to make comparison of scale. I need two functions, R and theta, right? So uh, uh, the reason I need R and theta because I, I want to be able to talk about Ricci coefficients of care and curvature coefficients in care, which are expressed in terms of this R and theta. And then I take gamma check and R check to be the difference between gamma and gamma care. Uh, R check dif difference between R and R care. And I make the, I assume that they are all of epsilon. You know, so it's, it's a small perturbation. I'm, I'm not too far away from care. But of course, the problem here is that uh, uh, which frame are you talking about? Obviously, in which functions are theta you're talking about? Because obviously, well, this function and theta will be connected with the frame. We'll see later on how. But uh, uh, obviously, I can change the frame uh, and uh, if, for example, when I change the frame, nothing good happens, in other words, I can't make anything vanish, uh, then uh, I have a problem because I don't know which gauge to choose to start with. So anyway, the first remarkable fact in analyzing frame dependence, so these are frame transformations, this, uh, uh, passing from uh, a frame is 3, 4 and the horizontal one to a new one. Uh, it, they are expressed in terms of a function, a scalar function lambda, and functions which depend on. Uh, so these are uh, one forms on horizontal structure, and uh, they are all of epsilon. And uh, uh, of course, it, it, in reality, I have to look at these terms also, the quadratic terms. But anyway, linearly at least, that's what happens. Uh, and uh, uh, the remarkable fact is that. If I do, uh, and this is, of course goes back to Tolkowski, is that uh, uh, these curvature components are all epsilon square invariant. So in other words, it doesn't really, they don't matter too much. These uh, extreme curvature components, they don't depend too much on the particular frame I'm choosing. They still depend in non-linear way, but uh, at least at the linear level, they don't depend. And that's very important. In particular, as we know, uh, a A bar verify all of epsilon decoupled wave equations. So what that means is that uh, you get the, the usual Tewkowski equations combine those nonlinear terms, but the nonlinear terms will be quadratic. Uh, and then hopefully you, you will be able to do something about that. All right, so now uh, uh, what, what happens when you calculate new calculations, uh, you get uh, the Tewkowski equations, which as I said earlier, there is a wave operator applied in A, but there are also additional linear terms. The same thing for A bar. So these are the two uh, curvature components. There are, uh, there are error terms on the right-hand side. There is a Chandra-Seca transformation, which, uh, I mean, I, I, there's no point in, in getting into the detail, but as you see, they, they depend only on derivatives with respect to the frame. Uh, some coefficients, which you have to find out, they are very explicit, and this function, this function q, so q bar is, is uh, the, the usual uh, conjugation, complex conjugation. So, uh, so you, you get this equation, as I said before, these equations are not very good for analysis because they are not, con they are in no way conservative, even in, in linear theory. Uh, but uh, with these transformations, you get new equations. Uh, so these equations were exactly the equations discovered by Ma, uh, which uh, 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 in, in that case, it was a linear series. So these terms, the, their terms, these are nonlinear terms, right? So otherwise the equations are, are exactly the ones uh, that uh, you see in uh, Ma's paper. Uh, so uh, you still see some linear terms, but the linear terms come up with a, with a small constant in front of them, and they have some special structure. So it, it, it's much better than what you have here. There are still linear terms, just like here, but, uh, uh, but as you see, the, these linear terms depend only on A, and they have a uh, special structure. Anyway, I don't want to get into the details of this because it's not important here. There are, of course, error terms. The error terms also have uh, uh, structure, uh, the null structure, as already was discovered by Martin, Martin in his talk yesterday. 
But there is actually something even uh, beyond the null structure that uh, I, I want to say a few words about. Anyway, here is a strategy. Okay, so now uh, we have we have these equations. We have the, the chandra sekar transformation. We have these general frames to start with. Uh, of course, you don't expect that you to get anything relative to a general frame. We'll see it immediately. That's not possible. We need to make some gauge conditions. All right, but anyway, the strategy is, is that somehow in controlling Q and A, in other words, uh, uh, this uh, invariance that we have here in this equation, in controlling these pairs, uh, we will use uh, these two equations uh, and hopefully uh, you will have to be able, we should be able to control these times. Obviously, uh, that's, not, that's not easy. And that comes up in this uh, second step. So in second step, you have to control these two terms, which means these error terms, which means you have to control gamma check and R check. Remember, these are the linearized quantity, in other words, the one that are obtained by subtracting the cat values. And uh, you expect to have some null condition. And uh, uh, as far as the error for uh, equation for Q frac is concerned, uh, this is almost uh, the standard uh, null condition. Uh, However, for this one, it's, it's a little bit more complicated and actually it's something that I would prefer to call it the strong null condition. I'm not sure I'll have time to talk about it, but if I have time, I'll say a few words about it. So there's something, something uh, much, uh, much more subtle in the equation, in the second equation, the, the equation for Q bar. So this, this is the equation, remember that, that uh, uh, is connected with A bar. Uh, okay, so uh, now, Number three, and this is fundamental, in order to control gamma check and R check, we did a non-linear gauge condition. In other words, you, know, you could in principle control these quantities, but to control all the other quantity, of course, I mean, essentially we have only this one as far as uh, gamma check and R check are concerned, to, contain, to, 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 to really control all the other quantities, you have to have a non-linear gauge condition. Finally, there is, a, uh, there is a top derivative estimate. So this is something that we have to do in, in this work. Uh, in the previous work, actually, the one that has already appeared last year, we, we show how to control gamma check conditionally on estimates for our check. And in this new work, we actually estimate our check also uh, and, and close everything. But in order to do that, it's actually quite complicated. It's a lot of work. Uh, you have to use a wave equation for QFRAC, but you also have to use a, a wave equation for P. This was, by the way, uh, the equation for P was mentioned in fact in, in, in the work for, in, in, uh, in uh, Blue's work, uh, Blue's lecture yesterday. And of course, one has to use all the Bianchi identities. But anyway, it's a long story, and obviously I will not have time to talk about it, but I just want to mention that uh, controlling top derivative is, uh, is uh, one of the hardest things of the, the whole the whole argument. Uh, finally, you have to set up a continuation argument uh, and that's based on uh, a notion of GCM admissible space time. So this is our way of solving the problem of the non-linear gauge condition. So I'll talk about this in a second. And then uh, bootstrap assumptions for these linearized quantities, gamma check and R check, okay? So now I come back to the crucial slide. Uh, what is a GCM admissible space time? All right, so this is a picture of uh, the so-called GCM admissible space time. First of all, think about some initial conditions, which are put here in, not on a space-like hypersurface, but on a, on a uh, layer between two null hypersurfaces. So the fact that uh, I can make that assumption is based on some previous work uh, that I've done with uh, Nicolo that allows you to come from a space like hypersurface to uh, allows you to go all the way to this uh, region. So somehow you can assume that you already know the space time of this region. So your initial data are here and you construct the space time from it. All right, so, uh, so then you have the boundaries of the space time, which uh, is, is GCM at this is the space time. Uh, the most important part of uh, the boundary is this sigma star. This is a part that is supposed to go to null infinity. Sigma star will converge as you go to as you go to infinity. You will converge to uh, to scar, right? And uh, even more important than sigma star is s star because everything starts with a star. 
this is uh, the it's supposed to be a sphere and a geometric a, a topological sphere not a geometric one and uh, everything is built out of this All right so uh, so we have uh, a star is what we call a gcm surface and I'll, I'll i'll talk about this in the next slide so this is a gcm surface so it satisfies certain conditions that I will describe. Uh, it allows you to define both A and N, in other words, uh, uh, find, it's something that will converge to the final A to the final N, right? So these are quantities that you have to define here, here on, on, on a star. Then uh, uh, you can also define sort of the beginning of the axis uh, of symmetry of the, of the new care or the final care, which you will get by convergence uh, and uh, then uh, you define sigma star. So sigma star is a space-like hypersurface, which is constructing starting with a, a star, but it, it consists also on GCM surfaces and additional conditions. So I'm not going to write uh, those additional conditions here. It just uh, suffices to say that uh, there are also various conditions which are verified here. Once you have this, once you have sigma star, the rest of the space-time is constructed as follows. You, you construct a function u, which is not an optical function, but almost an optical function. And it leads to, in fact, not to null hypersurfaces, but to time-like hypersurfaces. This is a little bit like the function u in care, in care itself. And in fact, it was used by, to, uh, uh, used by Peter yesterday. Uh, OK, so that's uh, the, the function u. Uh, and you go, you construct the space time all the way up to this t. Which is a time-like surface, which is sufficiently, it, it's uh, it, it's in sort of the near region, if you want to call it, uh, and uh, it's where you really have to change somehow the propagation. So you propagate things going in this direction. As I was, all the quantities are propagated in this direction. When I mean all the quantity, I mean the gamma okay. check. Are checked. Excuse me, Sergio. Yes. There was a there's a raised hand. Yes, please. Yes. Hello. Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to get the raised hand to to speak, but uh, it's it's not working at the moment. I don't know why. Ah, okay. Uh, so, sorry. Yeah, please keep going. I'll try and work on this for some reason. Oh, hi, Sergio. It's oh, Ryan. There we go. There we go. Okay. Yes. Um. So these. So the GCM spheres. How are they? How are they related to the, I mean, so you have this non-integrable structure. So, mm -hmm. but now you have these GCM spheres. So there's some integrable foliation there. So how are these two related? Yeah, so uh, so you when you construct, you construct a sphere uh, in a space time in which, uh, well, so let, let me leave it for a second. I'll, I'll, I'll come up in the next slides. I'll, I'll, I'll talk about how you construct the spheres. Right, but for the moment, let's assume that you have these spheres. Let's assume that sigma star verifies these conditions, and then uh, you construct the space time. As I said, you go all the way to t. From t, you go in the uh, in the opposite. So you change direction of propagation. Instead of going this way, you go this way using this function u bar. Uh, this foliates a space time which we call the m int, uh, which goes beyond the new horizon which is going to form. So this is expressed in red. And of course, you, you, you never mentioned the, the red horizon except at, at the very end, which is the final horizon. Uh, there, there are some additional structure uh, which have to do this functional and theta that I mentioned. It, it's not enough to construct a frame. Uh, you also have to construct the uh, structure. And finally, you have to put some bootstrap. So again, once again, you start with a star, uh, you construct a frame, you construct functions are in theta, you construct the frame, uh, you construct this hypersurface, and then you construct uh, a frame going in this direction. Uh, you construct all the quantities, uh, gamma check and up check. You go all the way to a time-like surface, which is uh, in, the, in the sort of interior region, far away from infinity. And then you, you move in the other direction in order to go through the, uh, through the horizon. Uh, now, uh, and then uh, when you do a by continuation argument, everything will be upgraded. In other words, you upgrade a star, you upgrade, upgrade sigma star, you, you upgrade A and M, and of course you, you upgrade the axis. The axis changes, and uh, uh, 
obviously the final axis would be obtained by some kind of uh, convergence right all right, all right. so now uh, you you are asking me a little bit about uh, what what you do so suppose it, you have your continuity argument right uh, so in other words, I have my sorry excuse me I have the bootstrap assumptions I have uh, I, I have all these geometric structures that I mentioned once uh, I I do that, I, I get estimates. So I, I, I use the estimates that I have for uh, extreme curvature components, which are A and A bar. Together with the conditions that I have here, in order to get estimates for all the quantities on sigma star, once I have the estimates on sigma star, I, I go all the way here in, to up to T and get all the estimates. Uh, so when I say good estimates, I mean estimates in terms of initial data I should have said, Imagine that the initial data is uh, is uh, controlled by by a constant which I call epsilon zero. Uh, the bootstrap assumption you'll have a constant which you call epsilon, right? Uh, and uh, in the process of doing the estimates, you show that everything is estimated in terms of epsilon zero. Once you have that, you 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 extend the space time a little bit. You extend also also of course the frames, uh, but what you are going to miss will be the fact that the new space time which you construct, so this is just local existence to, 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 to extend the space time a little bit. Uh, the only thing that you are going to miss is the fact that uh, you, you don't have these GCM hypersurfaces anymore. So I will have a space time, right, which is extended. And in that space time, I will construct a sphere, right? So the sphere has nothing to do with the original uh, Horizontal structure that uh, that was extended. You, you, does it answer your question? So I have the space time. The space time is given to me, and I construct a new sphere. Okay, and that sphere will will satisfy exactly these GCM conditions. Once I have the GCM conditions, I'll have the sigma star also constructed. I will also construct. All these things have to be constructed. Of course, it's a huge huge amount of work, and uh, in particular, it's the work which was done in the these two. Uh, papers, uh, these two GCM papers, and it's also the, the work of Shen that I mentioned. Uh, I, anyway, uh, that, does it answer your question, Ryan? Yeah, yeah, but but uh, I'll ask the you more, more about it later. The new sphere has nothing to do with the old Fourier, with the old Fourier okay. frame or the old horizontal structure. It's something new that you construct, and from it, then you are going to reconstruct everything else. Okay? At every stage, you uh, every stage of frame. The frame uh, that you have uh, at the given uh, in, 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 in this situation here will be will change when you construct the new, uh, new space-time in, in the continu continuity argument. Anyway, so this is, of course, a long story. I, I won't be able to say everything here. I, I just want to compare a little bit with, uh, 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 with our previous work, which was a polarized work. Uh, so the, the difference, the picture is essentially the same. Uh, you still have a star, you still have the GCM condition, you still have sigma star. This, however, is going to be a null hypersurface, so it's going to be at 45 degrees. There is no end top here, which uh, I didn't even have a chance to talk about. Uh, so uh, there is an X, there is an in, there is this T, which is this time my hypersurface. And, uh, uh, and the only, uh, the major difference is that uh, it's easier to construct this as star and sigma star. The conditions are the same, but it's easier to construct them. The other major difference is that A and A bar, which are these uh, extreme curvature components, uh, are also much easier to estimate in that case, than in this case here. And th this is a part that uh, I, I hope to be able to talk uh, at the end. All right, now let me go very fast to the GCM surfaces because I think I'm already late. So, uh, so what is a GCM surface? Oh, by the way, I forgot to say, I, I had to make a comparison with DHRT. So, uh, so this is the famous Hotzeker, Rodiansky, and Taylor. So uh, they, of course, have something more general. However, the condition on a star exactly the conditions that we have. Uh, they don't have a sigma star. They have, in fact, a null hypersurface. Uh, the construction they use a double null. They 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 use a double null foliation instead of uh, the fact that uh, we extend things from sigma star using a geodesic foliation. Um, so it's more in the in, in, in the, the construction of bonding. It's closer to the construction of bonding uh, rather than the, the double null foliation. 
uh, it's also they also have something where they I didn't quite understand from uh, what uh, Martin was saying yesterday, but I do understand that they also move in this direction. They they go with a double null foliation up to some point in uh, up to some region in the interior, and then they also move in this direction. So this is also similar. Uh, and uh, uh, well, there are other similarities which I'll talk about in a second. So, uh, so let's uh, talk about the, the, the GCM uh, sphere and star. So what is a GCM uh, sphere? So first of all, it's, a, it's some sphere which is uh, uniformized. So I'm using uniform, I introduced coordinates, uh, which are uniform coordinates. So you have, uh, uh, you have th this expression for the metric. So this is something very general. Uh, so I can define, because I have functions theta and phi, I can define um, the standard spherical harmonics which are cosine theta, sine theta, sine phi, and sine theta, cosine phi. And then uh, there is a, the notion of effective uniformization, which we uh, used in our paper of 2019. It goes back to Obar, in fact, which is that uh, the integral on a star of these quantities are exactly identically equal to zero. So this is a way, you see the, the uniformization, of course, uh, the uniformization result is, is, is uh, very loose. There are many uniformizations. Uh, and uh, this, uh, what we call effective normalization, picks up the right one. In particular, what's important is that also we have stability results for this uh, uh, for these uh, uh, spheres. In other words, if we change things a little bit, you'd like you'd like uh, uh, to compare the quantities, uh, for example, the phi uh, of one given uh, uniformization. You want to compare it to the one of a different uniformization. Uh, in other words, for, for a different sphere also. So I change the sphere and uniformize a different sphere. Uh, if the two spheres are closed, I want this uh, this uh, phi, for example, to be also closed. Okay, and there are some other uh, important uh, uh, controls that you, you have uh, in the stability result. So this goes back to results of Fisek, James, and Mueller, which you use. And uh, we also use some work of the ladies, some improvement, in fact, of, uh, uh, of uh, this work. So what are the GCM here? So these are the conditions. Finally, uh, there is a condition on chi. The trace chi is 2 over r. This is exactly the value in Schwarzschild. Trace chi bar is minus 2, 1 minus 2 m over r, which is also uh, the value in Schwarzschild. This one is uh, divergence of theta minus rho. It's the mass aspect function. And we only have a condition of n larger than 2. So these are. Uh, uh, the larger than two, of course, expressed relative to, to exactly these functions, right? J, 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 the, the spherical harmonics. Uh, so uh, once uh, so once you, you set up this condition, uh, you impose, right? So there, there's a, the, need, the, the, the reason you impose these conditions is because for L equal one, the L equal one modes, uh, here, uh, if you try to if you try to impose all of them, you 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 have issues that have to do with the kernel of a complicated uh, nonlinear elliptic operator. Uh, so you relax uh, by doing this, but instead you have to impose other conditions that have to do with beta divergence of beta and curl of beta. Uh, so these are the L equal one modes of divergence of beta and, and curl of beta. But you see. Only the j plus and, and, and j minus divergence of beta, you, you put all of them to be zero, but the j plus and j minus uh, are zero, and you leave out the j zero, and that is the one that gives you the angular momentum. So you actually define the angular momentum on a star. This is uh, uh, the star here. You define the angular momentum uh, using uh, this uniformization. So uh, again, uh, if I'm to compare with a polarized case, uh, the conditions are, are essentially the same. Uh, uh, of course, there are some differences here that uh, it's, you, you don't have an angular momentum in that case. Uh, and, uh, and again, if I'm to compare with the HRT, they use uh, essentially the same conditions uh, and uh, they also have exactly the same angular momentum. All right, so let's, uh, let's go now. How much time do I still have? You have about 12 minutes. Okay, good. So hopefully I still have some time. Uh, 
So let's go to, uh, again, I go to the same picture that I had before. I was a little bit sloppy, so let's, let me repeat. Uh, there is uh, the, the boundaries. This is a boundary that has to do the initial conditions, which you also have to be constructed. So uh, unfortunately, I won't have time to, to talk about this, but these boundaries are also constructed. Uh, in other words, what you know is initial data here, but this, this, these boundaries, which you use now as initial data uh, for the rest of the space time, have to actually be constructed, and it's a long story. Uh, so, uh, uh, so yeah, there is a star, there is sigma star, there is this function u and u bar. Uh, there is also this m top here, which doesn't appear in the polarized case. The reason being that these hypersurfaces are, are uh, time-like, but, but this region is a kind of a trivial region. In other words, if I know everything, if I know my space time here and here, this region can be easily deduced by the local existence theorem because it's, a, it's, it's really a very small region. Uh, so, uh, uh, so there are uh, six theorems uh, which relate to a, a fixed GCM space time. So, in other words, you give a space time, you impose these conditions, uh, and you prove these uh, six results that have to do with control of all the quantities. So, in other words, M1, M2, M4, M6 allow you to estimate uh, gamma check and R check. Uh, for this given space time uh, up to epsilon zero, epsilon zero being related to the initial data. Okay, and uh, uh, then there is the extension procedure, which I, I, I mentioned a little bit earlier, where uh, you already have very good estimates all the way up to the top, which are of the size epsilon zero. You extend the space time a little bit by local existence theorem, and then you are in the situation of having to construct a new GCM admissible space time. In other words, you have to construct a new GCL sphere and a new GCL hypersurface. And, uh, uh, and as I mentioned earlier, when you construct that, that's a purely geometric construction. You have a space time, you construct such a thing, right? It's a co-dimension two. Remember, uh, you construct this since it's a co-dimension two. And I think this is the first time in, in uh, the GR literature, and maybe even in geometric analysis, where you construct these kind of surfaces of co-dimension two. And then uh, uh, so the extension procedure is exactly the procedure in, by which you extend the space time and you find a new GCM admissible space time. And therefore, by continuity argument, you show that you can go all the way to infinity. All right, so this, these are the, uh, uh, these are uh, sort of the main step. And this is most of what I told here was already in our first paper uh, with Jeremy Sefter, which was uh, the paper last year. Uh, what was not in that paper were the estimates for A and A bar. So for cur the curvature estimates, also the top curvature estimates were not done there. Uh, and that's what we do in this paper. Uh, so so M M1 and M2 have to do exactly with this control of A and A bar. So again, I repeat, uh, in the other, uh, if you have M M1 and 2, the other results, which was M3, M4, M5, M6, had to do with controlling everything else based on the GCM assumptions and on the estimates for N day bar. And uh, uh, now, of course, you have to do everything else. I mean, you have to do this A day bar. Uh, so you, you get uh, complicated wave equations. Yeah, tensorial, first of all, Q is a tensor, is a two tensor, right? That's why I have a dot here to express the fact that this is a wave operator in the sense of uh, applied to tensor, to two tensors. Uh, so again, it's sort of a bundle type of wave equation. Uh, and uh, as we know very well, there are uh, lots of issues with this type of equations, even in the case of the simple wave equation in care space time. And let me go very fast over it. This was already mentioned uh, yesterday by, by uh, Peter. You have degeneracy of the horizon. You have a non-trivial ergo region where the vector field T, by the way, I didn't say what the vector field T is. Uh, it's, it's a vector field which in, uh, in care, it's exactly D over DT. And it can also be defined in perturbations using the frame. So, uh, so I, I, have a, I, I have a notion of 
of uh, what would be the uh, time-like inequality in CAD, uh, in perturbations of CAD. Uh, so non-trivial algorithm just refer to the fact that this T is space-like in a certain region. Uh, degeneracy at the trap set. Okay, so this is a, an important thing. You define the trap set to be the set in, in the space-time that you have uh, for this quantity t divided by cube less than delta, where t is this one, this cubic uh, term, uh, which degenerates. You see, if a is equal to zero, it degenerates exactly at r equals three f. So in uh, in Schwarzschild, this trapping region is in fact reduced. You don't need the delta; it just reduces to r minus three m. But uh, in uh, in care, of course, you have an entire region where you can have trap non geodesics. The other problem that you have is that there are limiting symmetries even in care, and of course you have to commit, you, you have to deal with this in perturbations of care. Uh, you have degeneracy and non infinity. This is the usual thing. You have this kind of degeneracy even in Minkowski space. Uh, you have a, the presence of linear terms and they bar on the right hand side. So you see, uh, what you want to do is to first estimate this, which is a little bit easier. It still has this term that uh, you have to worry about. But then you also have to worry about the terms on the right side. Anyway, so uh, you, you have to split the, the uh, analysis into, uh, into various steps. You have the nonlinear terms, you have tensorial current, and so on and so forth. All right, so let, let me, I, I, I want to finish with just a few words about the uh, sort of a very important uh, ingredient in, in the work, which, is, uh, which goes back to the work of uh, Anderson and Brew. Uh, so this is uh, this is a region uh, that you have to think about it. You can think of it that you are in care actually, and this is uh, this is the initial data on sigma zero. You have an apparent horizon which goes beyond the horizon, and you have two space-like hypersurfaces, sigma two and sigma one, given by a, a function tau equal tau one and tau equal tau two. This is a sigma star. This is a piece of space-like hypersurface that I mentioned, but you can also think of going all the way to, to, to scry if you are in care. There's no reason to stop here. But in, in, in uh, our GCM admissible space time, you've had this sigma star. So you, you want to prove an estimate for that, that kind of wave equation in this region, right? So you introduce uh, norms, which are norms, uh, which I call BEF, that consist on an energy norm which is a, a, a norm on sigma two and sigma one, in other words, on, on this uh, space-like hypersurfaces. A bulk norm, which is a norm inside all this region. And, uh, and the flux norm, which is uh, the, the flux here, or if you want, all the way to infinity. Right. The bulk norm is the most important one. It's, uh, it's the one that has to do with more of its estimates. And uh, it's the one that is degenerate. It actually degenerates exactly in the trapping region. So this is a trapping region. So, uh, so you have to worry about that you have very little information in the trapping region. So uh, anyway, so as I said, it degenerates a, a trap, it degenerates at r equal infinity because you have very little control. As you see, as r goes to infinity, this goes to zero. There are all sorts of technical difficulties. In any case, uh, uh, this is, these are the norms you have. You also need to have similar norms for A Right, because uh, the equation set the, also the a on the right hand side. But in the first approximation, let's forget about the a. Let's let's just uh, just look at this equation. I suppose you, you just want to understand this equation to start with, or even less, uh, you want to understand. Uh, yeah. Okay. So this is uh, what's in here. Yeah. Okay. So so the the, the estimates are expressed in theorem a and b, which really say that this b. EF norms, the bulk energy flux norms of Q and A are bounded by the initial data. And some term here, which is uh, tau one, uh, where you have decay. I mean, in a, in a, it, these are useful in order to get uh, the actual decay estimates. But for the moment, you get just neglect them. Imagine that you have an estimate, which is uh, this estimate in terms of initial data. Imagine that tau one is exactly at the initial data, tau one being here. Right, so that one, imagine that goes all the way to sigma zero. And uh, 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 so these are the, the theorem for Q frap and A, 
and for Q bar fac and A bar, you see there is a difference. You cannot you cannot uh, get a, a similar estimate for Q bar and A bar as you go for Q and A. By the way, I forgot to say that this P refers to weights. Uh, so the the the, the weights uh, I am not going to mention much here, but but they have something to do with decay. So in other words, you kind of expect that Q bar would behave worse than uh, than uh, Q frac. Q bar frac is worse than Q bar frac. All right. Okay. Right, so uh, let just, me let just me to go. let you know. Just to let you know, Sergio, we're 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 sort of coming to the end here. Okay. Good. So let, let me let me finish with this. Uh, this discussion in Schwarzschild, where I, I mentioned a little bit this uh, this work of uh, and and blue, uh, not not in Schwarzschild, actually. Yeah. yeah, first of all, in, in Schwar if I were in Schwarzschild, uh, the more or less energy estimates are based uh, on vector fields, uh, vector fields x, which degenerates exactly at, at uh, r equals three n, uh, and there are some other vector fields uh, that you have, and uh, uh, you. You, you look at space-time integrals of a vector field plus a correction applied to psi multiplied by the wave operator, integrate by parts, you get boundary times. This is typical to uh, more of its estimate. You get boundary times, uh, which are the, this boundary uh, on n, and the boundary times are then estimated by the energy estimate. So that, that's basically how it goes. It's, it's very classical by now, has been used by, it's a structure has been used by many, many people. Now, if you go to, uh, However, if you go to care for small a, uh, this will not work, right? So uh, here is what does work. First of all, uh, we call that in care. So this is now exactly in care. You have uh, the standard symmetries given by the vector fields T and Z. So this is D over DT and D over DZ. These are Kinney vector fields, which commute to the wave operator. But in addition, you have a, 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 the so-called Carter operator, uh, which also commutes. So this is a second order operator. Uh, and uh, it's connected to something else, which I call the modified Laplacian, uh, which looks like this. You see, again, in, in boil link with coordinates, that's how it looks. Uh, it, you can also define it invariantly, which is very, very important uh, for perturbations. Uh, and as you see here, it's defined purely in terms of the horizontal structure. Uh, so uh, anyway, so th this can be done invariantly. And then, uh, what one does is that you, you look at the wave operator uh, and you do commutations with the second order operators, dt squared, a dt d phi, a squared d phi squared, and all, and the operator all, which I, I, uh, I mentioned here, actually, it should be calligraphical, but anyway, it doesn't matter. And then you do a more of estimate, which is very similar to the one in Schwarzschild, uh, except that you do together, you do a more of estimate together for all these expressions, uh, which are, uh, sorry, wait, wait, I think it's not set here. So this psi a bar refers to exactly uh, applications of S1, S2, S3, and O to the psi. So these quantities, uh, so what I have here is actually a four tensor. This is a four tensor, and I'm calculating something related to this four tensor. I do integration by parts, the usual thing, you get uh, a quantity P, which is positive everywhere, uh, and it's coercive everywhere outside the trapping uh, region. And uh, this quantity is uh, estimated again in terms of boundary terms, uh, B, and B once again is going to be controlled by the energy. Anyway, so this is a, this is a story. I, I just, obviously uh, I went too fast uh, for you to get a, a, a sense, but uh, the important thing is that uh, this uh, work of uh, Blue and Anderson and Blue was done in the case of care for the wave equation care can be extended all the way to uh, the, the type of equations that we need in our work. And I'll stop here. All right, let's uh, thank Sergio for um, I would like to leave time for, for questions. So um, please, if anybody. Yes, Peter. Um, can I ask about the GCM sphere? Yes. Uh, is, it, is it possible to take like a, a level set of R in the boyer lindquist coordinates? Is, is, would that be an admissible GCM no. sphere or, or would it have to be different? No, no, no. I, I don't think so. No. 
I mean, we do construct, by the way, uh, you can construct the, the in Schwarzschild, of course, is GCM sphere in Schwarzschild, uh, the trivial spheres associated to the, to the, the metric. Uh, in care, uh, they're already non trivial. I mean, constructing the GCM spheres in care is already non trivial. Uh, and it's, it's uh, an application of the whole construction. Thanks. Other questions? Yes, Lars. Yeah, so um, I was uh, wondering about, so part of this whole scheme um, is uh, you need a, a, a Tukolsky, so something analogous to a wave equation or Tukolsky type estimate. And so I was wondering- um, it, It's what, more what you call this uh, generalized Reggie Wheeler equation. Yes, yes, but so it's, it's a way, I mean, you have some transport equations and wave equations. And so, <clears throat> and to, uh, so you need some uh, basically decay estimate for that. And uh, is the, is the, is the, is that proven in the same region that you're working with, or is it in in part of that region, or or in the whole exterior? Uh, this is proved everywhere. I mean, the, the, the whole the whole space time. So uh, whatever you do for a and a bar is done on the whole space time. And you mean in, in that region that where you're uh, indicating. Uh, yeah, the entire. So this is what the, is the GCM of this space space time. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Oh, so and, and that's done sort of along the way uh, as you as you construct the whole mm -hmm. uh, the the whole Cauchy development, so to speak. Yeah, exactly. And yeah. It, it, it's it's important to note, and I I, I should have said maybe earlier, uh, the fact that you have flexibility about changing frames. You constantly have to change frames. So, for example, in in the paper number one. Uh, right in, in the work with, with uh, Jeremy Bastia, we were using uh, using something that we call the PG structure. So it's a principal geometric structure, mm -hmm. which is uh, with a certain type of frame. Uh, there was a certain type of frame here, and then you had to have a different frame here, right? Uh, and of course, the transition is not exactly smooth because you have to change directions. But uh, when you go to the curvature estimates, and all the estimates were done in, in the framework, if you go to the, the curvature estimates, you, you have to change the frame to a frame which is defined everywhere, which is smooth everywhere. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, which is not, well, you don't have to be so precise about the gauge condition anymore, because as we know, the, the curvature estimates are more invariant, right? I mean, the, the, uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, yeah, so I think covariance is, is a very important uh, principle. So you have to change. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. This, is a, this is a fundamental importance. We have to constantly change uh, to change the frame, and uh, uh, you, you want to have as much flexibility as possible so that you can do exactly what needs to be done in each case. So that's why I'm sort of opposed to the notion that there is sort of a magic frame in which you can do everything. You uh, you you have to constantly change the frame. Yeah. Not to speak about the fact that. In the limit, you get a totally different frame from the one you started with, right? So, uh, whenever I extend, I have to whenever I extend, I have to get a different frame. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, that's very subtle. All right. Let's uh, let's thank Sergio for brilliant uh, 